At one time, Mike Awesome's career looked very bright indeed. Awesome was the last great ECW world champion, and he made a name for himself in Japan, where fans admired his hard-hitting style. Many believed that he was the future of the wrestling business. However, nobody could have predicted the downturn that his career would take after he left ECW. Despite a promising start in WCW, things quickly went wrong when he was subjected to a series of terrible, humiliating gimmicks. And then, in the WWF, Awesome's talent was totally unappreciated too. In this video, we're exploring one of the most harrowing nosedives in wrestling history as we take a deeper look at the wasted WCW and WWF career of Mike Awesome. Before we get into today's video, let me know if you enjoy this kind of wrestling content by giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Mike Alfonso's journey in wrestling began in 1989, where he was a jobber in WCW and he appeared for various independent promotions, the USWA and Florida Championship Wrestling, to name just two. Alfonso's career trajectory went up a gear when he worked in Japan. He appeared in FMW under the alias of the Gladiator. Standing at 6 feet 7 inches tall and weighing 290 pounds, he was a big, imposing man. His in-ring abilities defied expectations. He had skills typical of a cruiserweight in the way that he would fly around the ring, but he also delivered power moves with genuine force, and no one could ignore that iconic mullet. As the gladiator, he won the FMW heavyweight title, along with other championships within the promotion, including the tag team titles. Alfonso started to alternate between working in Japan and in the US, where he appeared in ECW for the first time as Mike Awesome, starting in 1993. And that was thanks to Sabu, who convinced Awesome to come back to America and check the promotion out. The two men wrestled each other for the first time in the US in early 1994. Back in Japan, Awesome started what would become a legendary rivalry with Masato Tanaka. While Tanaka couldn't match Awesome in terms of size, he did match his intensity and ability to absorb a huge amount of punishment. The men engaged in hugely physical matches that went down in history thanks to their intensity. As the 90s went on, Awesome spent the majority of his time in Japan, where he made a huge name for himself over the years. He only returned to ECW in 1997, where he wrestled Balls Mahoney, and then in 1998, where he brought his feud with Tanaka to the United States. The men would wrestle at house shows and on hardcore TV, but their match at Heatwave 98 is the match that most of us remember the most. Their dangerous wrestling style suited ECW perfectly, and Paul Heyman had very big plans for the Gladiator. But sadly, Awesome got sidelined with a knee injury that put him out for over a year. It was at Anarchy Rules in August 1999 that he would make his big return. Taz was scheduled to defend the world title against Tanaka on the show, but then Awesome appeared and it became a three-way dance. Awesome eventually prevailed and won his first ECW World Championship. And he was a very strong champion. He defended the belt on television and on house shows for the next few months, and he had even more stunning matches against Tanaka. In hindsight, this would prove to be the pinnacle of Awesome's career. But it didn't feel like that at the time. We all believed that he was just getting started. But as the year 2000 wore on, dark clouds were forming over ECW. Paul Heyman was struggling to pay his performers, and checks were starting to bounce, and wrestlers 
were hemorrhaging the company. The ECW fans realised how desperate this situation was as wrestlers like the Sandman, Raven, Mikey Whipwreck, the Dudley Boys and even Taz started to jump ship. In the face of all these defections to WCW and the WWF, the fans felt like Awesome was their saviour. They believed that the big man was here to carry the company on his sizeable shoulders, hopefully onto happier times as the world heavyweight champion. But it wasn't to be. In early 2000, his contract was about to expire. Allegedly, Paul Heyman owed him around $50,000 and Awesome refused to sign a new contract until he'd been paid. It was now that he received an offer from WCW. They put a significant amount of money on the table, reportedly around $280,000, and he went ahead and signed a contract with them. Heyman would say that Awesome was still under contract with him, but that's a claim that Eric Bischoff and Awesome later denied. But one thing was for certain, Awesome was still the ECW World Heavyweight Champion. No doubt Heyman was pissed off with this situation. He didn't want his champion appearing with the belt on Nitro, because let's be honest, Bischoff had a history of messing with other promotions' titles. Awesome did debut on Nitro as the ECW World Champion, but to the relief of Heyman, he didn't have the belt with him. In order to get the championship off of Awesome, one of the most unusual matches ever was devised. Heyman called Vince McMahon for a favour. He wanted to bring ECW alumni Taz back to the company in order to beat Mike Awesome for the title. McMahon agreed, and for the only time in wrestling history, a WWF contracted wrestler faced a WCW contracted wrestler for an ECW championship on an ECW show. Of course, Taz beat Awesome and relieved him of the belt, and now it was time for the Gladiator to take the next step in his career. It was now April 2000, and WCW was heading down the chutes. The decision to hire Vince Russo to write the storylines was proving to be a disastrous one. They brought him in to try and reverse the company's ailing fortunes at the end of 1999, but he only made things worse. His idea of booking a wrestling show was to present Car Crash TV, and yet, having said that, Awesome's debut in the company was actually quite promising. He'd burst onto the scene by attacking Kevin Nash, which immediately painted him as a credible threat, and he even picked up a win over Hulk Hogan, with the help of Billy Kidman of course. He then went on to viciously throw Canyon off the top of a cage, which earned him the nickname of the Career Killer. Russo's fetish for Car Crash TV oddly provided the perfect backdrop for Awesome's wrestling style. He ended up in stretcher matches and ambulance matches, and his matches and feuds with DDP and Scott Steiner were really entertaining too, and could have gone on to be all-time classics had this been any other period in wrestling history. But soon, that promising start gave way to total disaster. The divergence in Awesome's career came at one precise moment. It was July 2000, and the final match in a tournament to crown a new United States champion. Awesome faced Lance Storm, and it could have been a wrestling masterclass between two of the company's best wrestlers, but it wasn't to be. Storm made Awesome tap out after just six minutes. After the match, he was consoled by two plus-sized ladies. Yes, almost overnight, the career killer had become the fat chick thriller. The reason for this sudden gimmick change was allegedly due to Awesome's family connection to Hulk Hogan. Awesome was first cousins with Michael Belayer, aka Horace Hogan, who was the nephew of the Hulkster. And this was the exact time 
that Vince Russo fell out with Hulk Hogan. And so it's said that Orson was given this terrible gimmick simply as a punishment for being kind of related to Hulk Hogan. And so we embarked on the era of the Fat Chick Thriller, where he flirted with plus-size ladies backstage and they even accompanied him to the ring. The Fat Chick Thriller even got some character development as it quickly became obvious that he was a feeder. And while Orson was still having half-decent matches against the likes of Lance Storm and Scott Steiner, it was impossible to take him seriously. Eventually, his main squeeze ended up turning on him and siding with Storm, and that, happily, put an end to this terrible gimmick. But what came next was arguably even worse. We were introduced to that 70s guy, a gimmick that reimagined Awesome as a character inspired by the pop culture of the 1970s, complete with retro outfits and references. He was even given a bus that was similar to the one from the Partridge family, which he used to make his entrances into the arena. For a couple of months, Orson was wasted in lower mid-card nonsense, including tag-teaming with Crowbar and feuds against the likes of Vampiro and the Insane Clown Posse. But it was now October 2000, and WCW finally got rid of Vince Russo. Terry Taylor and Johnny Ace took over the booking in late 2000, and clearly they were fans of the Gladiator. Things really started to look up for Mike Awesome after Vince Russo left the company. They started pushing him almost immediately, and he was in matches against Scott Steiner, he wrestled Booker T for the World Heavyweight title, and he beat Bam Bam Bigelow in an ambulance match on pay-per-view. And so, in early 2001, for some reason he joined Team Canada, despite not being a Canadian, but that was fine, because it was here he became known as the Canadian Career Killer. 2001 was looking like the year of WCW's resurrection, but all of the hope for a new future in WCW was completely crushed when Vince McMahon purchased the company. And so, he made his debut on Raw in June 2001 as part of the Invasion storyline. He quickly made an impact, being the first invader to win a WWF Championship by beating Rhino for the Hardcore title. He was on the losing end of a tag team match at the Invasion pay-per-view, where he and Lance Storm lost to Edge and Christian. Sadly, this would be the peak of his push in the WWF. He got totally lost in the shuffle during the Invasion storyline, and he didn't do much better afterwards. Orson became a lower card afterthought. He'd sometimes appear on Velocity or other sea shows where he would lose to the likes of Fanaki and Ball Buchanan. And he was released from his contract in September 2002. He went back over to Japan where he was welcomed back with open arms by the fans over there and he resurrected the Gladiator character for the rest of his career. He returned to WWE in 2005 for the One Night Stand tribute show where he beat his old friend Masato Tanaka. In fact, it was another reminder of the talent that was squandered during his career. He actually felt that he was underpaid for the match by WWE and that was one of the reasons he decided to retire from the business. He said at the time that he would only ever return if the money was right. But in February 2007, Michael Alfonso committed suicide. Sources close to him said that he'd become distraught at the breakdown of his marriage. What a shame that a man so talented was treated as a joke by both WCW and WWE. The success that he found in Japan and ECW should have just been the start of an illustrious career, not the peak. <laughs>